Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, President Knapp. <laughs> Obviously. I didn't do that well in stats. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the courtesies that you extended. And I would uh, just reminisce uh, very quickly. Uh, a year ago, this last January, uh, at the inauguration, we needed a place to put the Joint Chiefs of Staff while we were waiting for the uh, parade to start. And uh, President Knapp was uh, very, very uh, uh, gracious in using his house uh, to have us meet there in an historic event, having us all there together before we went to the inaugural parade. So thank you, sir. We appreciate that. And thank you for the introduction, Kathy. It's been a great partnership over the years, and I really appreciate the uh, chance to be here. And I'm also <clears throat> very honored to be here uh, with Lisa Jackson. You know, uh, tough times produce great leaders. Uh, Lisa's going to be up, and she's going to talk to you in a little bit. Uh, we have been arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder in the Gulf. Uh, dealing with some of the most pressing environmental leadership issues I think this country has faced in a long, long time. Uh, you're not successful uh, creating a whole of government effort and unity of effort uh, unless you have leaders who are all focused on the goals and are willing to uh, become part of that team and even uh, rise above that and become leaders. And Lisa, just thank you so much for being here today. I look forward to the discussion later on. Thank you. I thought the best way to start this discussion about unprecedented events and how government responds to them would it be to take you back to my uh, first class year at the Coast Guard Academy. Uh, it was Thanksgiving week. Of course, everybody wanted to get the first class year over with, get to their first billets, get out and join the Coast Guard, do what they were going to do. And the Coast Guard Academy, and I think the entire Coast Guard, was rocked, shocked, and dismayed at an event that occurred off the coast of New England uh, that week. And some of you may be too young to remember, but I need to refresh you on this because it started me thinking about how uh, organizations respond in crisis. Uh, but moreover, it started the Coast Guard as an institution thinking about how to deal with crises and unprecedented situations. Uh, there was a Coast Guard cutter, the Vigilant, was moored next to a Soviet stern trawler, and we were conducting negotiations on fisheries in the North Atlantic. Now, this was before the 200-mile limit. Uh, we had uh, foreign flag fishing vessels fishing 12 miles off our coast, and the only enforcement mechanisms we had were international treaties at the time. Uh, during those negotiations, a Lithuanian seaman on the Soviet stern trawler indicated his intent to defect and jump on board the Coast Guard cutter. This set off a chain of consultations up and down uh, the chain of command, uh, clear to Washington. And to make a long story short, in the process, of trying to figure out what we were going to do, consult within the interagency, try and get direction from higher levels of government. All the signals got attenuated. All the governmental, political, and leadership intent got garbled. And in the end, uh, we allowed the Soviet uh, people on that ship to come on board the Coast Guard cutter, physically subdue the seaman and take him back. It actually resulted in a book being written about the uh, event called Day of Shame and resulted in a, a TV movie on HBO about the event. That resulted in extensive conversations inside the United States government about a how to handle these events, especially events involving foreign nationals. And it resulted in a presidential directive that required consultation whenever you had an action or an event that involved a foreign national. And over the last 40 years, that doctrine, that consultation, that process has evolved to the point now where it was successfully used to handle some of the critical events that were taking place during the piracy case with the Marist Alabama. And the only reason I bring that up is if there's a traumatic event and you learn from it, you don't add a crime to a crime. If you have an unprecedented event and you're able to glean out of it what you need to, to improve performance going forward, you will do that. What started out as one of the most uh, traumatic events in Coast Guard history actually paved the way for some of the most intensive consultation that takes place on maritime security events uh, in this country today. So what does that mean for us moving forward? We are always going to be faced with events that we cannot predict. We're always going to be faced with the need to act under conditions of uncertainty with incomplete information. And the question is, how do we, as a nation, how do we as a government, how do we as leaders optimize our performance 
and achieve those effects when confronted with a crisis? How do we make government do what people expect it's supposed to do? And folks, it is not easy. It's not easy because we're a democracy. We were created messy. <laughs> and it was for a reason. But our democracy and our constitutional system was not created to deal with instantaneous crisis. It was deal with governing a republic under the notion of federalism. So I want to talk today about a couple of key items that deal with unprecedented events. And obviously, we'll talk a little bit about Katrina uh, and the current oil spill. And Lisa Jackson and I will both talk about some of the challenges that kind of frame these issues. But I thought it'd be worth it, here in this institution, coming from the public administration school, to talk about governance issues related to these unprecedented events, uh, what we need to learn from them, and the thing we need to achieve if we're going to be successful in the future. And there is one thing we have to achieve in dealing with a crisis or an unprecedented event, and that is unity of effort. And I'm going to distinguish unity of effort from unity of command up front. Those of you in the audience who are in the military, as I have just retired from, understand we have unity of command in the military. When you join the military, you have to memorize the chain of command from yourself to the president. Okay, And so when there's something going on inside a Title X operation, the Department of Defense, the line of authority goes straight to the Secretary of Defense to the President. And that's actually codified in law. If you're dealing with an event that's not defense related, what you have to gain is unity of effort. Because you can't subordinate one Cabinet Secretary's authorities and responsibilities to another. They have to coexist. But they have to coexist in such a way that you can achieve the effects you're trying to, given the conditions that have been presented to you uh, by that event. That becomes even a greater challenge in the current day and age when public expectations of what government is supposed to do far exceed the legal mandates and the statutes we are trying to execute during that event and usually under some kind of constraints related to how we can spend the money that's been appropriated to execute those missions. The public expects a whole of government response. But right now we are executing in the oil spill a response protocol under the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, passed after the Exxon Valdez. In Hurricane Katrina, we are executing authorities under the Stafford Act. They have different bases in policy. They have different rationales regarding how they were created. They have different funding sources and rules associated with how that money can be spent. So for example, when we're trying to clean up an oil spill and control the containment, contain the well that's, that's uh, out there in the Gulf of Mexico, which we have successfully done, the public expects that society will understand what's going on down there, uh, the socioeconomic impacts, issues with the fisheries, issues with behavioral health, occupational health and safety. And some of these were not even considered when the, when the legislation was passed in 1990. My point is you're always going to have a gap between the laws that are being executed and the funding sources provided to execute those laws and the public expectation, that social contract between the US citizens and what government's supposed to do. So added on to the need to create unity of effort is also the need to understand what it is government can do, should do, and what they're legally not capable of doing and communicating that and trying to create uh, the effects you need going forward, which should then become the basis for uh, clarifying the laws and looking at uh, authorities moving forward. And let me compare and contrast uh, Hurricane Katrina and uh, this oil spill as an example. When we respond to a natural disaster, it is pursuant to an emergency declaration signed by the president that authorizes the flow of resources to state and local governments. Those resources are then used by the state and local governments uh, to respond to the disaster. The federal government does not have command and control of those resources, nor do they direct them. They provide them in support of state and local responders. Under the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, the government has federal preemption in managing and organizing the response. And the response is funded out of the Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund, not the Stafford Act of Disaster Relief Fund. 
okay? So, in responding to an oil spill, the legislative authorities that apply in this current response are embedded in the federal on-scene coordinator who acts as the lead for the federal government. If it's on water, it's the Coast Guard. If it's inland, it is the EPA through the federal on-scene coordinator, and they prioritize and direct the resources. Okay, can you imagine being a county commissioner in Florida or a governor of a town in Alabama or a parish president in Louisiana? And the government shows up and we're in charge by law. We cannot delegate federal authority and we have a fiduciary responsibility regarding the management of those appropriations. When everybody in the country has been used to, for many, many years, a Stafford Act response to a natural disaster where the money is provided and they execute the operations. So if you're wondering about the cognitive dissonance that's been created in the Gulf <laughs> for this response, it is embedded in two different response models that envision a different role for the federal government. One is provide the resources, the other one is actually direct. Now there's a reason for that. Oil spills move beyond state boundaries, they involve interstate commerce, they involve navigable waterways. There is a clear case for federal coordination. Just like there would be if there was a terrorist attack and the Department of Justice and the FBI were there uh, to coordinate the response to that. But it creates a challenge to build that unity of effort. In addition, there are things that need to be done down there that are not covered by legislation or appropriations. Some of the challenges we're dealing with right now have to do with things like seafood safety. That was not envisioned in the original act, but it's of critical importance to the economic life of the Gulf to ensure the American public that Gulf seafood that has been tested is safe to eat. Folks, let me tell you, Gulf seafood <laughs> that has been tested is safe to eat. Lisa and I eat it all the time. It doesn't account for the behavioral aspects of the population. We had an extraordinary tragedy in Alabama at the start of this event where a charter boat captain had been deprived of his economic base of operations and his way of life died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. We were unable through either authorizing language or appropriation to fund behavioral health interventions, 1-800 number for suicide prevention and things like that. So the question is, how do you move forward? How do you create that unity of effort? Well, it takes people that understand we're trying to achieve effects for, for the whole of government on behalf of the US citizens. So in this particular case, you make agreements, you make arrangements, you uh, negotiate uh, a way to work forward, and you do what you can for the people that are down there. Some of the things that we have done, and these are ad hoc actions that are not reflected in doctrine or law right now. We signed an MOU the Occupational, South, uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration within the Department of Labor on how we were going to take care of worker safety. And in our orders we, we uh, passed down there, we actually raised the protection levels regarding exposures of certain materials above the current regulations because we couldn't go through an emergency rulemaking. And we did that based on a, a memorandum of agreement that we signed. That now needs to be codified as we move forward. And I'm going to talk about doctrine and how we should uh, learn from these things moving forward. Seafood safety is another one. Uh, behavioral health is another one. There are effects generated by these events that cannot be predicted in legislation that empowers the agencies to work down there. So in that regard, if you're going to be reacting to an unprecedented event and a complex event, you need to be flexible, you need to understand what the mission is, what you're trying to achieve, uh, and if there is a way you can do it through cooperation and creating unity of effort in the federal government, you need to do that moving forward, okay? Now, how do we create people that are capable of doing that, that can bring that kind of uh, critical thinking and skill set to a problem? What I would tell you is that in this day and age, we need to be able to deal with complex organizations, public participation in these events, and be able to adapt current procedures and doctrine to new sets of circumstances. And when we're talking about how we train our future leaders, 
how we want to raise our new sets of senior executives and professionals in public service. And this is federal, state, and local. We need to understand that you need to be adaptable, you need to be flexible, and you need to engage in lifelong learning and keep yourself as wide open to new ideas as you can and be able to adapt and learn during a situation. Okay, Lisa and I didn't go into this spill as uh, deep water drilling experts. Okay? We are now. We didn't say it all in the Express last night either. <laughs> I didn't go into Katrina being an expert on levee construction. Okay? But you have to have the capability to understand the problem in basic technical terms and then translate that into mission effects that you're trying to achieve. Now, I want to talk about federalism just a little bit because it's important to understand what you have to do to, to deal with the effects you're seeing on ground. And I will start with Hurricane Katrina first. The big challenge we faced in Hurricane Katrina is I don't believe we understood the problem. I think most people in government, from the highest political leadership levels on down, uh, thought we were dealing with a hurricane. And had the levees not failed, the flood walls, flood canal walls failed, uh, it would have been just a hurricane. If that would have happened, Ground Zero had been Waveland and Bay St. Louis, uh, Mississippi, where the brunt of the, the storm came ashore. But that's not what happened. We had levee failures and we had canal flood wall failures. And when that happened, we weren't dealing with a hurricane anymore. We were dealing with a weapon of mass effect that had been used on the city of New Orleans without criminality. Now let me deconstruct it because it's important to understand this. We had the same effect as a weapon of mass effect used on the city but without criminality. Had a terrorist blown the levee in New Orleans, there would have been immediate federal preemption. The Department of Justice would have been there. We would have been dealing with a response, but the overriding federal interest would have been the criminal activity that took place that caused that impact on the city. So how do you manage a response that is equivalent to a weapon of mass effect being used on a city when you have a standing mayor, you have a governor, you don't have decapitation of government. You can't invoke the Insurrection Act or wave passe comitatus, all of which were talked about during that event. I was sent down to uh, Katrina on the 5th of September. That was one week after the sh uh, storm came ashore on the 29th. Uh, I got into New Orleans on the morning of Tuesday the 6th. I met with General Russell Honore. And we had to decide how to take the resources that were there and apply them to effect in support of a standing mayor in a city that had lost continuity of government with no basis for federal preemption. So how do you do that? Here's what we decided to do. Uh, we divided the city into sectors. Each one of the sectors was given to one of Russ Honore's military units. 82nd Airborne had the Central Business District. St. Bernard Parish, which had original, original flood surge, was back flooded when the uh, Lower Ninth Ward was flooded, and had a million gallon oil spill from the Murphy Oil Refinery, got the triple whammy. It was, it was a really a bad situation down there. We gave that to the Marines. <laughs> we had the Louisiana National Guard that had been called up under Title 32, which is the state authority. Russ Honore did not have command and control over the National Guard forces. They were assigned a sector so they could have unity of command within the National Guard, and then we coordinated how they interfaced with the other sectors. In other words, we did a workaround. Okay, and I want to talk about that in a minute because uh, what came out of that is some significant work by something called the Council of Governors, which was established by executive order this last January by the President that has found a way to move forward and de deal with both uh, National Guard that may be called under Title 32, reservists and active duty folks that are trying to help in, in a disaster. So what we did was every day we planned to go through the city and we did three sweeps of the city while the water went down, hit every house, you saw the markings that were put on them to make sure we know who had been there, what the result was and when. But when we did that, we were providing access and security for local law enforcement officers who made the determination on whether to go into a house, and what action would be taken. 
We did not preempt the authority of the local responders. We supported them with access and security, much larger force than they were, but tried to retain the federal role of one that was supporting state and local responders. And if the city did not like the plans for the next day, then we would change them. But that's how we accommodate it moving forward, okay? We had the reverse in this oil spill. We are trying to create unity of effort on the ground in an area where local officials were used to controlling that. That requires intense consultation, interaction, explanations, midnight calls, heated conversations alongside the road, venting to the media, <laughs> questioning my legal authority and competency to work. And that's okay. That's okay. This is a society down there that's grieving. Grieving over an environmental disaster. And one of the things you're going to do if you're going to respond to one of these events, you need to understand that's going to be part of what these people are going to do to cope with that. Having lived through Katrina and Rita and the storms of recent years only to have an entire summer's worth of fishing and tourism taken away from them, you better be prepared to have some people that are frustrated, angry, and frankly angry at you because there's, sometimes there's nobody to be angry at. And you've got to manage that going through. So I get asked a lot, what's the difference between uh, Katrina and this oil spill response? Well, the fundamental difference is, as far as the government's role, we are operating under two different legal paradigms, two different funding sources, and two different concepts of operations regarding the employment of resources. And if there is a fault here on government, it's that this legislation was passed 20 years ago. We've been operating under this legislation successfully since then, but this is the first time we've had a major oil spill where it produced a kind of concern in the public and they were not aware there was a difference in the response protocols. And that resulted in some societal cognitive dissonance, folks. And I remember having a meeting with the parish presidents in Louisiana. I said, we're going to collaborate, we're going to cooperate, but there are two things I cannot do, because I don't have any choice. I cannot delegate authority to you that I'm required to execute under federal statute, and I cannot uh, fail to meet my fiduciary responsibility uh, for managing government funds. So there's a captain of the port, that's an official function in the Coast Guard, that allows him to be the federal on-scene coordinator. I said, I can't make you the captain of the port. And one parish president said, but Admiral, I want to be the captain of the port. <laughs> and that's understandable. So one of the unprecedented things about this event was the fact that we had never instituted these protocols for a, a spill this big since the act was passed in 1990 and the general lack of understanding of that by the public and the senior leadership in government. And central to that was a lack of understanding on what a responsible party is. You've all heard that. BP is the responsible party, as is Transocean. They were both designated. That is assigned in law and requires that they fund the cost of the spill, the natural resource damage assessment, and any action taken associated with that assessment. But there are two issues related to that RP designation that have never been understood, and we're going to have to do something about it moving forward if we're going to be successful in the future if we have another event like this. Number one is that the entity responsible for the event is working on the response. That is a key, a key provision of the legislation that requires them to be financially responsible and be there in the command center writing the checks, bringing the contractors in and working it. That was not well understood in advance, and all the preparation in the world does you no good if the response doctrine is not understood when you start. The second one, and it's a real tough one, is the fact that we, could, we will never be able to sever the fiduciary responsibility of a business to their shareholders and their legal requirements for SEC filings, how they, uh, they book costs on their balance sheet, we cannot change that. So the fiduciary link between the people working the spill and shareholders was not understood either. And I think going forward, there's going to have to be a lot of discussion centered around what it is we think a respons responsible party should be and what they should do in the future. We don't know what the next unprecedented event, complex event, is going to be. But I can tell you, we won't be prepared for it, we won't understand it, and since that is something we haven't dealt with before. 
That doesn't mean we can't be successful. That doesn't mean we can't deal with it. It doesn't mean we can't do better than we did in the past. So my challenge to you all here at George Washington University and around the country, my challenge to government entities and leaders, folks that are working in government at all levels, is to start to think about what your role is when there is a crisis, what the country expects, and understanding there will be gaps in what you're legally required or allowed to do, what you're legally required or allowed to spend money on, and they aren't going to match. You will never have an event that absolutely matches the statute you're trying to apply and enforce or execute. So the question is, how do you do that? How do you create unity of effort across government? And it is not just restricted to crises, man-made disasters, natural disasters, terrorist attacks, or whatever. It's everyday operations that we're conducting. It's piracy off Somalia. It's illegal migrants in the Straits of Florida. It's drug interdiction in the Caribbean. It's tsunami response in Pago Pago. In each one of those cases, there's an expected role of government. And I think what we need to do is continually trying to close that gap, not let it widen any further. And that's creating governance structures that allow us to do that. I would hope that the lessons learned from Katrina and this oil spill make us improve for the next event. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples about how we can do that. Then we want to get Lisa up here and let her talk. In the early morning hours following the earthquake in Haiti, uh, we had Coast Guard cutters come ashore in Port-au-Prince. Uh, they were the first folks ashore, and what they found was totally devastating. And you all saw the coverage. And the question is, how could the government of the United States help? I was present in several meetings in the White House Situation Room, where the cabinet was there with the president. And the discussion was, how can we bring elements of national power to bear in an unprecedented event, but this time in a foreign country? I had an extensive conversation with Secretary Napolitano. Uh, I talked with Greg Fugate, the director of FEMA. And we decided that one of the things we could do is export what worked in Katrina to Port-au-Prince. So what we proposed was an incident management team headed by an SES uh, from FEMA and a Coast Guard flag officer to take the same equipment that I took into New Orleans that gave me the command and control capability and put that at the disposal of the U.S. ambassador in Port-au-Prince. In other words, to give him capability and capacity that creates uh, your ability to do something they had lost in New Orleans because of the loss of continuity of government, which they had lost in Haiti. Similar situation, except on a national scale. So we were able to do that. What we couldn't do is get those supplies in fast enough. So the next unprecedented thing that happened in the Haitian response was an agreement that was negotiated by Secretary Clinton to allow us to take control of the Haitian airspace to optimize the efficiency of the landing slots, to be able to get the commodities in, the relief workers, and everything else. So we took something that would worked in Katrina, the model that Russ Honore and I had used on the docks in New Orleans, and we actually exported that in support of Lieutenant General Keene from U.S. Southern Command, to support the response in Haiti. Fast forward. I was with the President on the 15th of uh, June in Pensacola, Florida, and we are flying back after he had a meeting down there, and we had a very heart-to-heart -heart talk about what we needed to do uh, to accelerate this response improve our performance. And I told the president, one of the things I have to do if we're going to optimize our response is we have to take control of the airspace in the Gulf. And he asked me what I meant by that, and I said, we've had eight near mid-air collisions. The helicopters going out to the rigs, the spotter planes, everybody flying around out there. So we have a safety issue to begin with. But what we don't have is an integrated surveillance system that can tell us where the oil is and direct the vessels of opportunity that are pouring in now that we've been able to put the uh, uh, the shrimpers back on the water and so forth. Based on that conversation with him, I talked to the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, Nordy Schwartz. I talked to Sandy Winnefield out at the U.S. Northern Command. We sat down and we talked about it, and we went to the first Air Force at Tyndall Air Force Base, and we said, can you do this? And you know what the answer was? 
Yes, we can, and we'll use the same protocols and doctrine we developed to take the airspace in Haiti. So sitting down at Tyndall Air Force Base is the Command and Control Center for North America, where we do the, uh, the fighter launches to intercept aircraft that are coming in and haven't identified themselves. They had just moved into a new command center, and right next to that command center was the one they had left. We filled that. It became the Air Coordination Center for this response. And we took the exact same doctrine they had used in Haiti, applied it to that airspace, except instead of landing slots, it was sorties being directed to find oil and report back. We teamed that up with imagery and working with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency uh, using uh, national assets, we were able to complete a, what's called a common operating picture or shared situational awareness, which is key to establishing unity of effort moving forward. So let me tell you where I think we need to go and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to Lisa here. Uh, as a result of what happened in Katrina, a legislation was passed that required the president to create a council of governors. Uh, and that was signed last January. I attended the first meeting of the council of governors as the commandant of the Coast Guard before I retired. And on the government side, uh, Secretary Napolitano and Secretary Gates chaired their portion. The council of governors are, are a group of 10 governors made up of five Democratic and five Republican governors, co-chaired by a Democratic and a Republican governor. Their charge was to create unity of effort and better coordination on how we manage the call-up of National Guard troops, active duty military, the problem that Russ Honore and I saw in New Orleans, and how to create a better uh, process to move forward on that. And what they are moving towards now is a concept whereby they can take uh, an adjutant general from a particular state and give him dual authority over forces that have been recalled by a governor under Title 32 and active duty reserve forces that are out there working for the active duty military. So you can create that uh, unity of effort within a state, not have the jurisdictional issues related to that. That is a work in progress. Uh, they will be meeting this fall in November to try and finalize the way forward. Uh, there's a tremendous opportunity that's going to come to us, I think, in this next election cycle. There are a significant number of governor chairs that are turning over. And in addition to working with the, uh, the, the, the National Guard issue regarding Title 32, Title 10, is the opportunity to create some kind of a, uh, a package or an exercise system to take brand new governors that are coming in and create those expectations that they did not have when we started the oil spill response, where they were not familiar with the doctrine or what should happen. So we are taking positive steps moving forward to get better on how we react to these unprecedented events. But it has to do with building elements inside government, the capacity, the capability, and sometimes new authorities that allow you to adapt and move those successful uh, proofs of concept that you did in one, one operation and move those forward. It hasn't been real visible to the public, but in the last few years, I have seen it happen, and I've given you a couple of examples. If I were to have a major oil spill that I was responsible for tomorrow, which I hope we don't, the first thing I would do right now is take control of the airspace. I wouldn't wait till the middle of June to do it. That's what we've got to learn. We've got to be become a learning organization inside government. We've got to learn to take those examples, make them doctrine, and institutionalize them before the next event occurs. And then know, no matter how much you do that, you will not be able to understand all the parameters of that event when it occurs and build the kind of leaders that can be adaptive and flexible and agile uh, when the country needs them. If we do that, uh, we will do what this country expects of us, and we will close that gap between the social contract the public thinks government should do and what government's capable of doing. So thank you very much. Great to be here today. Thank you. It makes me want to sign up for uh, 224. <laughs> so if, if you think you thought, well, who, Lisa Jackson, have I seen that name before? It might be because she was recently named as one of the top 40 women who have influenced the world by Essence magazine, or Newsweek's most important um, people in 2010, or the Time magazine's 
2010 list of the 100 most influential people in the world. Her name is, is Lisa P. Jackson, and she's the administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. She's actually from New Orleans. I grew up down there and graduated with summa cum laude with a degree in chemical engineering from Tulane. And then she went to Princeton to receive her master's in the same field. She began her career at the EPA nearly 20 years ago. But then she left for a period to head up the New Jersey's uh, Department of Environmental Re um, Protection, and then came back to serve as administrator in this administration. She's the first African-American administrator of the EPA, which has fueled her commitment to expanding the conversation on environmentalism into new communities. This week, she oversaw a reconvening of the cabinet members who make up the interagency working group on environmental justice. And it was the first time this group had met in 10 years. Among other firsts, she's the first administrator of EPA to issue regulations on greenhouse gases. That's something else we've heard a little bit about. Uh, a critical first step in, uh, in work to address uh, climate change. Uh, she, as well as everybody at the Environmental Protection Agency, also played a role uh, along with Admiral Allen in the response to the uh, oil spill. She worked very closely with Admiral Allen uh, in the response, traveling multiple times to the region and working as part of the response leadership team. And as I understand it, they become more than just effective partners but friends through the time they spend in this effort. And I know that as a New Orleans uh, native in particular, she certainly has put her heart into the work down there. So we are just delighted to welcome the Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, Lisa Jackson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Already we see an emblem of Thad Allen's extraordinary skill. I could never stand in the middle there and speak to you. I'll be nervous enough sitting in that chair. So <laughs> kudos, kudos. Uh, just a couple of quick hellos. Um, GW graduate Seth Oster, my director of communications. He's the best director in town, but don't tell anybody because then they'll try to hire him away from me. <laughs> and it's not going to happen. And Beth Craig who has um, taken on, I think, three different jobs in support of uh, my office and the agency since I took over as administrator. But she's done a phenomenal job running our AIR program, uh, working in our Office of Administration and Resources Management, and in the front office. Is that just in the last 18 months, Beth? And I believe she's also on your board here. All right, I'm supposed to speak just a few minutes after that remarkable talk. And as usual, just sitting there, I learned from uh, Thad Allen, and that has actually been part of our relationship, and he talked about learning every day, and I would like to thank him for giving me that opportunity well before um, the crisis uh, in the Gulf that was the BP oil uh, rupture, the well uh, collapse and oil release. Yes, I'm a New Orleans native. Um, I actually, my mom's birthday is August 27th, so I was living and working in New Jersey when Katrina approached the Gulf, but I was home in New Orleans because we were all there to see my mother for her birthday. So we actually drove her out of the city on her birthday. I grew up in the Ninth Ward, the Upper Ninth Ward, not the Lower Ninth Ward. And uh, that was the last time we saw that house looking anything like what uh, it was. It sat underwater for two weeks. And so certainly uh, I was familiar with uh, Admiral Allen's work uh, in response to the spill. Certainly Many New Orleanians have sort of local heroes. The, the, the city loves characters, and um, they also love heroes, and Fat Allen is both, and <laughs> in a really good way. Uh, <laughs> and so um, I, I had become familiar with the tens of thousands of people that, uh, he's very modest. He talks about dividing the city in sectors, but tens of thousands of people who you know, owe their lives or some part of their recovery to uh, the work of he and the men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard. And um, I didn't really, I think even the first time I finally got a chance to meet him, I don't remember if I even thanked you for that, that but certainly uh, we as a nation and certainly the Gulf Coast region owed him enough uh, even as a result of that. You know, and I was thinking back on how we actually finally did meet. We didn't meet in the Gulf, thank goodness. And that was 
actually because of Thad Allen, who said, um, as though he could see the future, you know, EPA, I'm a brand new EPA administrator, really just trying to make sure they don't take the job away from me. Um, and he reached out and we had a breakfast. I think it got canceled. I think I canceled it. And finally he said in a way that's gentle and yet just a little bit uh, uh, professorial. You know, EPA and the Coast Guard usually have occasion to work together on some pretty big things. <laughs> Might be good if we establish a, wor a working relationship now. And sure enough, um, that was just smart. That was the essence of leadership, the recognition that all things boil down to relationships, to an ability to integrate, as we just heard him say so eloquently, what we have to do into a structure that never, ever is built for the incident at hand. Um, we certainly um, know that tough times inspire uh, great leaders, and I think uh, in every in every challenge, one of the things I'm always amazed by is to me, great leader, leaders are, have a measure of humility because they recognize at the outset that they're up against something they don't know. And that is also true of um, my friend, the Admiral. Now I'm gonna save it um, a little bit for the end, but I do want you to um, think about all the lessons that he just taught us. And what I heard in there was humility and humanity, a recognition that this all comes down to people. I heard strength and fortitude, um, but I really also heard ability. There is a reason you are in school, students, and it is to begin learning, because there really is a knowledge base here. Um, a lot of the things that um, he was uh, talking about is experientially are part of, I'm sure, what you're learning from a textbook. So it really is for a good reason. So how do I handle an unprecedented situation? They asked me to speak to that for a few minutes before we move on. Um, I work in threes, three is the magic number, three pieces of advice. So um, that covered the first one, the Admiral did. Expect the unexpected. Expect that in any situation that which you're not ready for will happen. That was really the core of Thad's insistence that we get to know each other a little bit because he knew from experience that he didn't know what it was but that EPA and the Coast Guard because uh, we share a response job. We do a lot of work and it's very, very different but we're responders. We're first responders when there's a release of oil. EPA is um, one of several first responders now when there's a release of a chemical substance. So inevitably, there's no playbook for that. Um, I was trying to think of examples. Um, there are many, many, probably, um, you know, whether it's on, on the policy side, trying to deal with something like um, CFCs, a chemical that destroys the ozone layer, learning. First, there's always some recognition on the policy side that your world is about to change, learning that this chemical um, that's in everything from coolers and air conditioners, hairspray, deodorant, is, are literally destroying our atmosphere. And then you have to think about trying then to, to develop a policy in response to it, a, a reaction to it, that takes into account that this is now ubiquitous in our society, so there's gonna have to be a need to educate and respond in a way that allows us to take into account that people are gonna have to change their behaviors and their thoughts. And um, honestly, that is the only person who can say cognitive dissonance and make it sound cool, and you don't go, <laughs> what is he talking about? But, I, it's a little bit of that. Oftentimes, as a policymaker, you're going to find yourself having to do something that isn't what, it's not precedented. No one ever thought it would happen before. Those are unprecedented challenges. So it's not always an emergency, an attack or a response or an anthrax release on Capitol Hill. Sometimes it's just that the unprecedented situation is a policy challenge, that you will have to apply many of the things we just heard the Admiral speak of. Today, obviously, we face another unprecedented challenge in the form of climate change. Climate change was not a priority issue when I uh, began my work with EPA in 1987. It, 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 was, it was an issue. It, was, it hadn't quite risen to the front burner of our consciousness, um, but there were people working on it even back then. I surely never, never dreamed that I'd be working in some ways right there on the front lines with many of my colleagues. Nancy Sutley is here, the chair of the Council on Environmental Quality. Um, 
to, to work in support of this president to deal with this unprecedented challenge to our, um, our planet. I also didn't expect that I'd be working and meeting and hanging out with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Back then, he was, <laughs> he was a Terminator. <laughs> So, you know, there's that John Lennon quote, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. It's the unprecedented stuff that is what leadership is about. And that is actually probably a great way to sum up public service. It's certainly what happened with the BP oil spill, an explosion, a collapse of a well on the 40th anniversary of Earth Day, and EPA working to do our job. See, when it happened, right up until then, we were uh, reinforcing that EPA is back on the job. That was part of our message. I think I was here and spoke about EPA is back on the job, and we're going to follow science and the law. We were talking about transparency in our operations. We were talking about environmental justice and bringing the concept of the environment and environmentalism to co communities across this country who had never seen themselves as part of the environmental movement. We were laying all these foundations, we were making other plans, and here comes this unprecedented event in the Gulf. So that leads me to my second piece of advice, which is when that happens, when the unprecedented happens, and you're trying to search for what is the right path, play to your strengths. Play to your strengths. Hold on to your core mission in whatever organization it is that you happen to be uh, a part of. Now, that's not to conflict with the that's uh, very smart advice, which is to continue to learn every day. But as you try to look across as policymakers or as responders in, in, the, in the public sector, the NGO sector, what, what I saw sometimes was some uh, not necessarily genuine advocacy, right? But when you play to your strengths, when you say, what does EPA do? Well, we're not the first responders. We work in support of the Coast Guard under the National Contingency Plan that uh, Thad outlined our job was to support them and we have a strong working relationship at the field level in doing that. And there have been times when the Coast Guard supported EPA uh, in recent spills up with, uh, in uh, Michigan and Illinois. It was the other way around. So that happens as well. But if each one of us, and I think this uh, happened very well in this response, each one of the federal partners played to their strength, did what they did best, but did it in an organized way, and swiftly um, and expansively. I think this is easily uh, one of the swiftest and fastest expansions, for example, of scientific expertise and scientific applied science in our nation's history. EPA then played to its strength, aggressive monitoring of the air, the water, um, sediment, to detect whether we had any immediate uh, concerns with respect to human health and then later to the environment. Over the course of the response, EPA took over 5,000 samples, air, water, massive amounts of data. We made an unprecedented effort to make that data publicly available. And we dealt with the issue we always deal with, with data, which is you can get it, but if you can't contextualize it, if you can't tell someone what it means, you're really not doing any <laughs> service to the public. So we were uh, pretty uh, much sticklers about trying to get the data up quickly, but to do it in a way that people could understand. We did some of our own science. The uh, science on dispersants, as we now know, uh, didn't really address the issue we were dealing with, and we were also trying to look at a request from uh, BP to use dispersants in a novel way, and so we determined that we could do our own, set up our own testing, and we could also do our own toxicity testing of dispersants. We learned later that um, that testing mostly confirmed what we knew, that dispersants are less toxic than oil alone, that when you mix them with the oil, they're about the same toxicity as the oil, because what they do is make the oil um, basically more available to the critters. We made a, a commitment to continue working on science as well. We worked on community outreach. We have been focusing on environmental and expanding the conversation and talking to communities because that's what we do. It's a core strength of EPA, so we continue to do it. We put a strong focus on communities during the response. We added an environmental justice person in our emergency operations center right here at headquarters during the BP spill. We made sure environmental justice organizations were part of the weekly White House outreach calls with respect to the spill 
and members of EPA's very senior management team went to EJ community meetings to give the community, and you heard about the fragile sort of mental state of uh, Gulf Coast community down there, a chance to be heard and to see people face to face. And over time, uh, the Coast Guard was wonderful about organizing these meetings where everyone, almost all the federal family and oftentimes state and local governments would be there to deal with the community. I like to say, uh, in closing and in my in support of my third point that um, when I first went to the Gulf on my very first trip down I said each one of them had their flavor this one was I want to hear from the people down there because I know the folks down there are very proud you heard about the fact that they were itching to help they were itching to get out there to do something they saw it was almost like an analogy to a hurricane with today's modern forecasting you can see a hurricane coming for you know potentially a week out now it can take that last minute turn and you know we're getting better and better at knowing precisely where it will go but people down there are very used to that that scenario of like this approaching oil it was coming I called it like uh, hurricane BP it's coming <laughs> right uh, we're all fighting it trying to stop it from coming trying to keep it away from the shorelines trying to do our jobs but they saw it and it was producing in them a level of you know anger and frustration and fear that's very natural when you know you're about to face something like that these are also people who had just been through that with hurricane katrina and rita so i was actually expecting to do exactly what that said so to be a face that they could yell at and scream at and be angry at but oftentimes oftentimes the first thing they said and i know um, thad heard this a lot too was how can i help how can i help what can i do to take care of my family, just to, to defend my job, my life, my livelihood, my culture. They wanted to know how I can help. And that's my third lesson, which is there will be calls. You have to answer the call. There is nothing more rewarding, of course, than answering the call. There's nothing like knowing that you are somewhere where the talents you have and the skills you have, or maybe just the desire you have to help, will make a difference. So do answer the call. That brings me back to Admiral Thad Allen, our guest of honors. He has answered the call in two of the most challenging situations we've confronted in recent years, actually three, with Rita. In the face of unprecedented events and unprecedented leadership challenges, Admiral Allen gave an unprecedented service to this nation and to people in great need. So I'm glad to be honoring you today, sir. It is my honor and privilege to share a stage with you. Thanks very much. Now, you can go on over here. For now, we will have an opportunity for dialogue with Admiral Allen and Administrator um, Jackson. But I want to welcome to the stage uh, Dr. Ron Carley, who is yet another innovative and creative and inspirational uh, leader. Uh, Ron has uh, been in, he will at, be bringing a local government perspective on the discussion today, as he has with students in our public administration and public policy program since uh, he joined our teaching for us in 1994. He has worked in local government for over 30 years and has extensive experience in emergency uh, management, including his uh, role as the senior local civilian official in the response to the terrorist attack uh, on the Pentagon 9-11. At that time, he was the county manager of Arlington County, the same role uh, from which he deployed three teams to the New Orleans Emergency Operations Center during Katrina. Arlington teams were also were deployed at different times to emergencies in Mississippi and, and Florida. He has lectured extensively across the country as well as abroad on emergency management. And in, in addition to teaching for us at night, he's also the chief operating officer of the ICMA, the International City Management Association, which is the professional organization of professional managers at the local level. This is the, the new job since he has um, left being county manager in Arlington. He is also competing at, completing a second term as the tri-chair of the National Homeland Security Consortium, which represents over 20 national associations that advises the federal government on emergency management policies. So you see, 
we have a lot of expertise on this uh, stage right now. And I'm going to turn this over to Ron, who will um, direct questions from all of you to our distinguished guest today. Okay. Thank you. Away, well, I, I guess I get to add to my robe, uh, Stephen Colbert robe. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Um, what, what, what struck me as I listened to both of you and watching you and seeing the kind of roles that you've been in, uh, you've obviously been in a highly politicized, highly political role, uh, but you're both career professionals. Uh, you've, you've come up through a lot of different levels and ranks in your respective fields. Uh, so could you just share with us a little bit uh, your perspective as a career professional and suddenly finding yourself at literally in the hot seat in what is a highly charged political environment. Admiral? Well, I've told uh, folks that have worked for me for a number of years that if you're going to work in Washington to be successful on a career basis, you have to learn how to be effective in a political environment without being political. Can you do that? When I say political, I mean partisan. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, if you don't do it, you won't survive. I mean, uh, this, this is a political town. We are a democracy, and I said earlier, it's messy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you have to de learn to deal with that. It's part of what I call the tyranny of the present. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be able to understand that that's the environment that uh, this country is founded upon. Uh, there's a political context to everything. And as we have said throughout this entire operation, uh, Tip O'Neill had it right, all the oil spills are local. <laughs> <laughs> Look up the quote. Uh, Madam Administrator. Yeah, I guess mine is a little different yeah. because um, I tried for many years to say my first line was I'm really not political, but that's forget hard. that now, huh? Yeah, that's hard to well hard to say once you take a political appointment, mm -hmm. and this wasn't my first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is really cognitive dissonance. Uh, yeah, no longer part of the civil service. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, sort of rank and file, but um, I, I think. I, again, I think this is a play to your strengths moment. Mm -hmm. I actually like the political system. Um, I'm not an elected official, mm -hmm. and that's not where I've chosen to be, but being in, a, in an environment where part of my leadership means I have to work with and for and, you know, um, several, you know, at least two branches of government and answer to both and understanding that you know it's part of how our democracy works as, as um, Dad said it, it's just you know sort of my world now and I had to sort of let go of the balloon of I'm just you know <laughs> sort of the average you know Jane who got promoted I mean, you know you're a crazy political point, animal well, no, <laughs> but I've survived confirmation which, That's, is, there you go. which is something <laughs> well I can't help but believe that uh, the performance uh, by both of you is uh, not correlated directly to the depth of professional experience that you've brought to these highly political positions. Uh, let me go to local government, which is you know, obviously an area that, that I care a lot about. Uh, Edward, you talked about the, the different legislation under which these two unprecedented events occurred and our lack of appreciation or understanding for the difference in terms of how federal government and local governments would interact. Uh, both of them were widespread, though. Both of them were of a multi-state nature. And so if I could put each of you on the spot a little bit, in such events, how should it work? What should the relationship be between the federal government, state officials, and especially, again, my special interest, local officials, so city and county managers, mayors, and county executives that are responsible for where uh, people actually live? Well, I think we, uh, we need to understand that uh, readiness and the ability to respond to these events is a shared responsibility. And I would say clear down to the individual level. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to have individual ways to uh, be able to survive. And uh, if, if, you're, if you're not physically relocated from your house, let's say, because of water or something else, uh, you ought to have plans at the individual level to be able to last and survive with uh, f food, water, and medicine for 72 hours, let's say. Do you want, uh, to I think show, want to take a show of hands to see how many people are ready for that in the room? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, about, about three. <laughs> I, I think what, what has happened in the wake of uh, Hurricane Katrina and some of the other incidents in this country is we're almost redefining what federalism is and what are levels of responsibility mm -hmm. and who is responsible for what. And I think uh, there's a certain level of readiness and preparedness which should be ex uh, expected of all levels of government. Uh, and I think uh, if that's going to change radically, then we need to have a discussion about it. Uh, to have to line up uh, uh, after a hurricane comes through within eight hours to, to need uh, food, water, and ice, 
at a, at a point of distribution, which then requires National Guard for security, you're putting demands on a system that could best be served other where, uh, I mean, other, other mm -hmm. places. Uh, and so I think uh, there is a role for the federal government. There is a role preserved to the states. Uh, but I think there's been some discussion, and I, I alluded to it earlier, what is the contract right. we have? What is expected of the government? Uh, because it appears every time we've had a large event, an unprecedented event, there's been a gap between expectations and what the government is prepared to do through a whole government approach. And uh, I'm not sure it's, it's, it's clear as it should be. So you think perhaps we should have further discussions? Oh, I, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, you know, it's hard for, I, I won't speak to the, um, to BP, because I think that covers it well. I think in general, um, the federal government over time has made a, an increasing uh, effort based on an increasing awareness that um, closer is better, mm -hmm. and that no matter how supple or how much time you spend on outreach, local governments are, for most people, all they ever see of government, and that's you know actually a good thing. So, um, you know, there are programs that we run at EPA that are not delegated to the states. Um, there are lots that are, mm -hmm. uh, and there are some that, um, they're not entirely voluntary, but there are some programs that we do with local governments that are extremely popular. The one that's in my head right now is our Superfund and Brownfields work. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are federal statutes that we implement, but you cannot clean up a site <laughs> without the local community's no. involvement. It's a partnership it's across many sectors, actually. As you well know. <laughs> and for the, uh, for the events, so it's cross-sector as well. Cross-sector and public involvement. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there'll ever be a, another major event in this country that won't involve public participation. And you need to plan for it and figure out how you're going to incorporate it. We had uh, this large challenge of vessels of opportunity that were made available to us. Quite that was prob probably a lot of other phrases that were used for that, too, along the way. <laughs> well, non-governmental organizations, mm -hmm. uh, social groups, uh, people that are active on the Internet, uh, uh, faith-based organizations, uh, they will participate, and if you don't account for them, they will still participate. And we haven't figured that out yet, have we? Well, I think there needs to be an intake model where we, get the, we, we take that, that, those resources, passion, and commitment, and, and you do something with it. The vessels of opportunity were a particular challenge, and I... Uh, the analogy that I used were the Minutemen at Concord before the revolution. They showed up with resources, passion, and commitment. Some of them had a musket and some only had a knife. And the question is how do you form them up and use them to try to achieve effects? And we had some very large boats and some very small boats. That was part of the piece I talked about, the air surveillance, mm -hmm. to try and figure out how we could employ them. But there's always going to be a novel approach where the public's going to want to participate and you have to allow for that. Let me ask you one last question. We'll open it up to the audience. Uh, you referred to unexpected events. Uh, you used the term adaptation and at one point ad hoc. Uh, I think what you're saying is at some point we've got to make it up as we go. And that the reality is that the laws are never going to mesh up completely with the reality. How do we, not, not only how do we teach and learn that kind of flexibility, but how do we institutionalize it, especially within very large bureaucracies? You go. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily say make it up as we go. I think you need to create uh, conditions for success and take as much ambiguity out of it as possible. It's only mad managing what you haven't dealt with before on the margins. If you look at some of the things we're able to move forward, like the, uh, uh, the approach to how we uh, handled support in New Orleans and how we handled it in New Orleans and Haiti, and then the, the air uh, control piece and moving that forward, the more you can take ambiguity out of it and apply previous doctrine, certainly dealing with a narrow band of what you haven't dealt with before, the, the more successful you're going to be and you're going to mitigate risk. So I don't, I don't think it's ad hoc or winging it, if you will. I think you have to have a basis for what you're trying to do. And those are the kind of critical thinking skills I think we have to develop. At the same time, there is, again, to use your words, a real need to adapt the structures that you have in ways that you've not done it before and perhaps around which you don't have explicit legal authority. And I think, you know, I think there's a couple of uh, keys. First, if you go back to how oil spills are generally responded to, there are contingency plans drawn up mm -hmm. long before the spill happens. That's the fundamental sort of, uh, you know, practice of preparedness. And um, so taking it away from this particular incident, you have to be prepared. You actually have to have sat around and worked with the group of people who are going to work on this problem when it actually happens. And then you have to drill it. Um, and then it goes back to relationships. It goes back to realizing that in the very best of circumstances, people who've worked together forever are going to have to um, 
uh, call upon all their strength and resources because they're working something they've never done before to make sure that um, you stay true to sort of um, the spirit of preparedness and operations and face problems together. And, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a groupie, but, you know, <laughs> leadership, it, that's what leadership is. Yeah. And I, I think that's what, in the president's uh, so designation of that, it was brilliant. Uh, it was the right match of person and challenge. And I also think that um, I, I watched from a very close vantage point the issues that we had to deal with together, which, you know, weren't many. Um, but I watched how he did it, and I think that um, it was based on his understanding. First, it was experience, but it was also based on relationships he had across the spectrum that he could call upon. And people would say, well, I don't agree, but it's that Allen, and I'm going to sit down and work it out. Sometimes they vented on national TV, but, you know, <laughs> water under the bridge. Well, since, since we are wallowing in praise for uh, the admiral, uh, <laughs> you're actually turning a little bit red, sir. Uh, <laughs> question, do we have enough Thad Allens? Do we have any? You know, the world does not have enough. Yeah. Um, and so how do, we, how, do we, how do we build some bench strength for people that can, that can, that can masterfully pull together those different parties uh, the way that we've seen him do that twice? Listen, I, I do think that a lot of what I heard um, Thad talking about is inherently governmental, mm -hmm. government at its best, government the way we talk in this administration. You, you hear the president always speaks. That really is what mm -hmm. the American people expect. Um, and, you know, what you're doing here is part of it. I mean, across this country, we have to, in a tough environment right now, um, convince young, talented people to participate in public administration mm -hmm. and public service. And uh, it's hard for me to know. I mean, I have a f two teenagers. I'm curious mm -hmm. to see whether they'll think there's any reason in the world that they should do that. Um, and we have to be very careful of that because we really do need, um, only the government can do, mm -hmm. you know, most of, or a lot of what was done. And we need talented people and we, we have to train them and, and recruit them. Yeah, that is at the core of why we wanted you here this afternoon. Uh, and so let us turn to the students that are here and uh, see what uh, questions you have uh, for our panelists. What a rare opportunity to have uh, uh, two great contemporary leaders on stage at the same time. Aren't many schools that will get this <laughs> opportunity? And so uh, do we have questions from the audience? So we have a mic. Where's my microphone? Hold it up. If, if you could maybe come down toward the center here and if you have a uh, Question, raise your hand or move toward the center. There we go, don't be bashful. I'll do it like class, I'll come out and call on you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was curious, uh, this is for Thad Allen. Um, you said that, the, that BP was the responsible party and I was um, curious, so how did it work in terms of who ultimately made the decisions of you know, how things were to be handled? You know, you, you were making that's suggestions and then they could decide whether or not they're going to do it or how did that work? That's a great question. Um, the Oil Pollution Act of 1990 uh, basically made a public policy decision that we were going to create spill response capability in this country in the private sector. And we did that by requiring vessels and facilities to have response plans and offshore drilling units to have response plans and identify those resources. That resulted an entire industry being formed of oil spill responders, what we call them oil spill response organizations or OSROs. And what responsible parties do is they bring those contractors in and employ them uh, to do the response and the cleanup. Uh, so what happens in a, in a spill of this magnitude is you have an extraordinary number of resources being brought in, extraordinary number of these oil spill response organizations and contractors. BP is responsible for paying for that. And so there's a, there, there's a coordination issue there where BP is bringing the contractors in and deploying them, but the overall coordination to achieve the effects of the response are the responsibility of the federal on-scene coordinator, which was either the Coast Guard on the water or EPA on land. Uh, it is the order of magnitude of this response uh, that required BP to manage a lot of contracted resources to the ends that were directed by the federal on-scene coordinator. And the ability to explain that response model, which has been in effect for 20 years, is the one that's been very difficult to do with the American public. 
Yeah, just to illustrate that, I talked with the uh, city administrator for uh, Gulf Shores, Alabama, and again, continuing the theme, he said to thank you very much for uh, your support. The city of Gulf Shores was very appreciative and very complimentary of the federal response. Uh, long list of questions and concerns and, and ideas about how we go forward, but one of the things he identified that he never fully understood was who was, who was really calling the shots. Uh, was it the federal government or was it BP? And he said, you know, I just never really knew. Yeah, let me, let me expand on that. Uh, the federal on-scene coordinator could say uh, there is a, a three-mile stretch of beach that's been oiled. Our priority is to get that cleaned up. BP direct the contractors that are there. And so the question is, the final execution was usually done by a contracted oil spill response organization. The activity was directed and approved by the federal on-scene coordinator, executed by contractors or retained by BP. And that sounds convoluted. But that was as envisioned by the legislation that was passed in 1990. And one of the things we've had a very hard time doing in this, this response is explaining that was the intent of the legislation and that is the requirements of the law. Great. Another question? Back in the back. My question is just about uh, the kind of prevention and preparation that we need maybe to um, forestall some of these unprecedented events or make it at least a little easier to deal with when they do happen. So I'm thinking of things like inspections of rigs or levees. In your experience, how can we sort of sustain public support for that kind of preventive work during times when it just seems inconvenient or not necessary to really uh, regulate the private sector? But how, how do we sustain that awareness and commitment when the unprecedented event isn't in our face so that we can, so that we can stop some of these things, stop them before they happen, um, maintaining the commitment when the pressure is not on. I'm sort of thinking partly of Homeland Security. You know, over time you can't stay on red alert all the time, so you begin not to have the water, you know, the, the water and other things you need in cases of an emergency. So how do we, during the downtimes, how do we prepare and stay committed? Well, in response to this uh, particular spill, uh, let me just explain where, where I think we're at. Maybe Lisa wants to add a comment. Um, the Oil Pollution Act of 1990 was passed after the Exxon Valdez, and I would call it basically a tanker-centric legislation. And while we spent the decade of the 90s implementing that, the vessel response plans, the facility response plans, certificates of financial responsibility uh, that would ensure that the cleanup could be uh, carried out if that, if that were to happen, during that period, uh, drilling moved offshore and went deep. And the response planning did not keep up with it, frankly. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at worst case discharge estimates, that would be the basis for having those contractors on call for spill response. Uh, there, was not, there was not a lot of validation and following up to make sure we had that absolutely right for an uncontrolled well. And that's one of the gaps that's gonna be looked at by the Presidential Commission. Another thing is the uh, review of those plans was the responsibility of the Minerals Management Service of the Department of Interior. Obviously, if you're gonna have a federal on-scene coordinator that has to direct the response, uh, there should be a role for those folks in reviewing those plans and see whether or not they're adequate to what would be needed to the response. Uh, so if you're looking in this particular incident where the gap was, that was the gap. Lisa? No, I, I don't really have anything to add except to say, um, you know, every great law, every great regulation is just words on paper without the resources to make it happen. And, um, you know, somebody, it might have been that, somebody handed me a book about the Valdez with all the things people knew needed to be invested in after it happened. And then the money, you know, over time just isn't there. And we're in a really tough economic time now. But, um, there's, there's lots we write. I, I think we know in general what we need to be vigilant on, but we as a society have to be willing to either invest the resources or um, set up a structure. I mean, I think one of the interesting things that's happening now is not done is that the companies themselves are putting together some money and resources of their own because, um, you know, ask BP shareholders what this has really meant. It's still still out there in terms of that company. So they, they see a reason for them to just set money aside now and say we're going to resource this to a different degree. Um, you know, as, a, as governments, there's uh, been lots of discussion and talk and thinking, and the, presidential, the President's Commission is all about recommendations to try to ensure that we do a better job of keeping up with technology. Now, a recurring theme that's come up in our discussions is the fact that the uh, Oil Pollution Act of 1990 contemplated a robust 
research and development program in government would actually be managed by an interagency committee. Uh, and that committee exists, but the funding available for that research has dropped off dramatically three or four years after the event itself. Uh, it was a half-life in the bureaucratic memory, in the budgetary memory of the country. Uh, and if you, uh, part of that gap that was introduced there had to do with the, uh, our inability to sustain research and development in that period. Yeah, and that's probably not going to get better in this economic environment. Uh, the half-life may be actually shorter. Uh, let me ask you this. <clears throat> this obviously was a catastrophic failure. Uh, could it happen again? What, what, what's our risk out in the Gulf? Well, let me answer it this way. I it has already happened again. I mean, we had two oil spills on land, both of which um, uh, EPA, uh, Coast Guard was in support, state of Michigan. We're all worried about oil getting into the Great Lakes system. Mm -hmm. And Governor Granholm was not happy about that. Um, Would that we, be an understatement? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, we had, you know, a fairly large one in the state of Illinois, and um, but for some well-placed um, uh, containment systems that ended up collecting, catching most of the oil, it could have uh, entered um, uh, waterways and been all over the place. I mean, it becomes a mess. And then, of course, everyone watched in horror the natural gas issues um, out in California. And so I think, once again, we as a country realize that we have, you know, a series of potential environmental uh, catastrophes to deal with, and I, I do hope that, although um, I don't think there's a reason for us to all panic and, and be afraid, I, I, I hope that the country, that Americans realize there's a need to not believe we're past the point where there can be an environmental catastrophe that can have a disaster, you know, an environmental disaster. We can still have them. What's your assessment of the risk in the Gulf? Well, I, I participated in a panel earlier this week that was uh, chaired by Secretary Salazar and included Secretary Chu from the Department of Energy, and then a, a panel after that that included industry, included the uh, CEO of Exxon Mobil, Rex Tillerman, and uh, Andy Inglis from BP. Uh, what is being done now in the oil industry, because this is very, very uh, salient in the discussion of the moratorium and everything else, mm -hmm. is a containment system that will be available in the future should there be another event with uh, wellhead control. Uh, and while this was a catastrophic event, what we did gain out of this was the BP engineering that created a containment system that ultimately worked. Uh, the problem is it took 87 days from the event uh, to basically uh, shut in the well. But that technology that was brought in from the North Sea and off the west coast of Africa to create these uh, uh, containment and capture systems has now been engineered uh, to, for the first time. And so I think the, the mandate going ahead, at least for the Gulf, is to come up with a containment system uh, that, that demonstrates an adequate, ad adequate standard days. of care that you can control the wellhead uh, if you lose uh, pressure, on, I mean, if, if the pressure mm -hmm. is lost on it, press, pressure control. And I think those discussions are going on right now. The oil companies understand they're going to have to offer a containment system if there's going to be any credibility moving forward in, uh, in, de in dealing with oil production in the Gulf. Right, thank you. Another question. Where's my, uh, uh, where's my microphone? <clears throat> I'm sorry. I'm having, where's my mic? Where? Go ahead. Yeah. Get the person closest to you. <laughs> Thank you, President. <laughs> so you talked about the volunteers that came and helped out. I was just wondering, what would, how would you advise the volunteer organizations that already have reserves for volunteers who are ready to go to the next unprecedented event? That, that's, that's a great question. Uh, let me give you a couple of anecdotes from Katrina and this oil spill, and I think there's a clear mandate that we haven't done enough to, to account for public participation. Uh, we had a significant problem in New Orleans uh, after the hurricane came ashore regarding animals. Animals uh, where their owners had left, uh, they were stranded. Uh, we had a lot of NGOs and just plain volunteers wanted to come into town and help us with animal rescue. Uh, but we also have folks that are driving around in cars that said FEMA Animal Rescue. They were just collecting animals and leaving. And we had the extraordinarily bad uh, experience of having uh, animals captured in New Orleans, pit bulls, and actually put into dog fighting. So it raises the issue of access, certification and competency, uh, security. And I think the way forward is to take uh, non-governmental organizations, <laughs> faith-based organizations, 
uh, people that have passion, commitment, and resources and figure out a way to certify them and credential them so uh, they're ready to go and when they come in they know how to fit in. Uh, we have something called incident command system in this country where you're certified in logistics, finance, operations, or planning and when you show up there's, a, there's already an assumed level of competency that you have and you're brought into the structure. I think if we're going to be successful in the future we have to figure out how to do that uh, with public participation. The only thing I'd add is that it's there's sort of a contradiction because these, you know, um, oil wastes aren't the most hazardous thing you can deal with, but we require some pretty specific uh, training and certification in order to deal with it. So on any given day, I might watch the news and I'd hear people railing that they weren't being allowed to do something to help, and then literally within that same hour, you could switch or even on the same channel hear people saying, I'm worried that I might be being exposed to something. Well, the, the first thing you do when you're worried about exposure is you separate the person from the potential threat. Well, but they want to go. And so I think um, what, what that talks about is very important. There are, uh, again, play into strengths. If your strength isn't hazardous materials response, um, maybe that's not where we, 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 can, we can sort of build that side of the voluntary uh, net, but it's a really important issue and um, one that I'm sure is going to come up over and over again. Okay, on this side, uh, right here. Um, you spoke earlier about having to recruit um, top kids in our generation for future leadership roles. I'm just curious, what are some tangible things and um, that you guys will go about doing that? That we what? what are some tangible ways that you guys would go about recruiting top leaders for the future? Oh. Incentives or yeah, it's stuff not about like that. bonuses. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I always tell people one uh, story, uh, then you go. Um, you know, okay, th yeah, seriously. So I told you about my mom. I drove her out after the hurricane happened. Um, I was working in New Jersey. I was working for the state government, so I'm still a public servant. We have, you know, we're comfortable as a family, but we don't have a huge nest egg. I got these two kids coming to college, and tuition's ridiculous. So, um, so, so it is you know, here for sure. <laughs> the, the but well worth it. it. <laughs> um, you, well worth it. You get what you pay for, huh? Well worth it. I know it is. I know it is. But um, so you know, I, I had a moment of crisis. Because there was a moment where I remember thinking, you know, had I first maybe gone, I'm an engineer by train and I could have gotten probably positions that paid a lot more over time, I could be one of those people rebuilding my mother's house. And my mother, by the way, very, very proud woman, would never let me do that. But this was, this is daughter guilt. <laughs> you know, what am I doing? How, oh, here's another one. I should quit this and go down and help. And I kept thinking about like what I would do and, and talk to my mom about it. And she was sort of the one that said, you know, this is about you doing, you know, sort of following your path. So there's a point to this story. I'm sorry so long. So now, you know, fast forward to um, just before uh, the well, I had my first trip as EPA administrator down to New Orleans. And I remember thinking, if I could build my mom any house in the world, I'd raise it, I'd make it energy efficient, I'd make it handicapped accessible, I would build her the house that, you know, she, she deserves. And my mom ended up selling her house back to the state through the Road Home Program. It is a government program. It is public policy. <laughs> it's something our government did. And what's happening to her home is it's going to be raised. And what's going to happen after that is that a developer, Wendell Pierce, everybody know the bunk, uh, and uh, I grew up with him, and um, uh, they're going to build an energy efficient, raised, handicapped accessible home where it used to stand. That's public policy. Public policy is doing for my mom, not for her personally, because she doesn't own it and it's best that she doesn't, but is doing that which I would have done if I was on the private side. There is tremendous value in using the talents that each one of you have for public service because there are outcomes that you will affect that wouldn't just affect my mom, that will happen for thousands of people. And I can't tell you how rewarding that is. So that's what I do. I just, I, I talk you into it. <laughs> so. Excellent. Well, I think there's always value in uh, being dedicated to something that's beyond your own interest, being part of a, of a larger effort, a larger uh, 
uh, good in this country. An antidote that comes to mind is, uh, and let me I'll get to the story too, like Lisa did. Um, <clears throat> last year, the uh, Coast Guard Academy had one of the really great uh, women's softball teams in the country, and we had a phenomenal pitcher. Uh, she had uh, a number of uh, scholarship offers to Division I schools, but decided to go to the Division III Coast Guard Academy <clears throat> uh, because she was from New Orleans. Uh, she lived there in Katrina. And after the storm, uh, she decided that uh, uh, given the uh, 33,000 people that were saved by the Coast Guard, uh, that's what she wanted to do. And I believe there are more people out there like that than not. And those are the people that uh, we need in public service. So let me ask you, what led each of you to public service? How did I mean, you, you had options. He what, still what has it? options. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to get hoisted on my own petard here. But uh, 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 I went to the Coast Guard Academy because I thought I was too small to play Division One football. <laughs> 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 and uh, things just kind of happened after that. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it just happens, doesn't it? It does, yes. But you didn't have to stay in the Coast Guard, did you? No, I think uh, what happens, and uh, related to the antidote about the, the young lady from uh, New Orleans, uh, the minute you're involved in a rescue, that has you an give somebody back their life, that or has you an give them a talk to you? a family, uh, and you've told them that their, their family is coming back, yeah. uh, that, that, that generates a lot of enthusiasm to keep doing that kind of work. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. So what, what led you down your path? Um, you know, I, I, my dad was a, a mailman. And I do remember, um, I, I do believe that that's in me somewhere, that mm -hmm. belief. Um, watching, I, every once in a while, he'd um, let me go on rounds with him. I don't think that was illegal. You know, we sort of watch him <laughs> from afar. It was um, New Orleans. Huh? It was in the French Quarter. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that's in me, and I also think that... Um, Can't you just see this little girl going around delivering mail in the French Quarter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, so I think that's it. I mean, it's kind of cool. The EPA building now is in the old... Uh, my office is the former office of the um, Postmaster General. And um, every morning I walk in, and there's the, the U.S. Postal Service emblem. I have to kind of literally walk around it or walk on it to get to my office. And I always say I think of my dad because, you know, he was a public servant. And for many African-American men in the South, that's all he could be. He could be a postal worker or he could be a Pullman porter. Mm -hmm. um, and he chose um, the former. And, um, you know, the U.S. government has always been an opportunity giver. Um, I used to recruit women all the time and say, a wonderful place to have a career. There is no, you know, mommy penalty, and there um, hasn't been uh, certainly one for me. And that's one of the reasons it's a good place to work. That's great. Thank you. All right, go back to the question on this side, uh, right in here, if you can uh, run around real quickly. And then we'll do this person over here next. Good afternoon, Nicole Rodriguez. My question is actually for both, though, uh, Admiral, and I'm going to use your words. Uh, you talk about the idea of public, uh, the public perception of what government should be doing versus government and what's expected. And it would appear as though uh, the idea from the public standpoint is that government should make them whole. There's a limited amount of risk in that government should make them whole. And if that's the case, how do we close that gap that you talked about? Uh, is that more really on the government side than to close the gap and on local, federal, and state? And how do organizations move towards that? How do organizations change? and prepare their employees for that and, and prepare their entire structure to move towards making the public whole again. Thank you. You actually said that better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is an issue, uh, what the public expects of their government. Uh, I think uh, and there, there are a lot of uh, uh, contextual pieces that, that, that make that, uh, that problem more visible to everybody. Part of it's the news cycle, the 7 by 24 hour, there is unflinching oversight on everything we do. And that creates expectations in the mind of the public about what government is or isn't, what they should be doing. Uh, we have never been so closely inspected during operations as we are right now. Uh, and sometimes I'm wondering whether or not I'm managing an event or producing a reality show. <laughs> Notwithstanding, I think there needs to be a very frank and open conversation about what government is and what we expect it to do, what we expect the individuals to do, what we expect uh, state and local governments to do. And uh, 
we are, it, there's a conversation going on right now on second and third order effects, uh, socially, economically, health-wise, uh, where you start to lose the nexus with what the cause and the effect was. And I, I don't know if we've ever really clarified that in the terms of this response, but it is, it, it is permeated the entire response, uh, whether it has to do with second and third order socioeconomic uh, effects, how much is a restaurant in St. Louis affected by uh, seafood issues in the Gulf, uh, what about the uh, people that uh, supply uh, supplies to a hotel that are 200 miles inland? Those are all being discussed right now. And I think what we need is a really honest understanding of what the limits of government are and what we want government to be. Uh, because I think there's a, there, there's a different set of expectations. And where there's expectations that are different, there's going to be at least a perceived uh, contract with the people that is not met. And I think it's time we had that discussion. That's great. I can't answer that. That's yeah. fine. Let, let me ask you this question. You talked about producing a reality show. Uh, with, with, with social media and YouTube, I haven't looked either of you up on Facebook. I haven't friended you yet. Um, <laughs> to, to what extent were those issues in this event? I, uh, Should I have been following you on Twitter? You wouldn't have found me on Twitter, at least before the, <laughs> after the 25th of May. Um, that's when I cease being the commandant. Uh, <laughs> John Holdren, the uh, science advisor to the president, has a really excellent uh, presentation he makes on climate change. And he basically says we have three options, uh, suffer, adapt, or manage. Uh, I believe that uh, internet computation and social media and the public participation that is enabled because of that is a fundamental change in our sociological fabric. Mm -hmm. It is the sociological equivalent of climate change. Therefore, our options are <laughs> suffer, adapt, or manage. So I am on Facebook. There, <laughs> there you go. Send, send your friend request in uh, after we finish this afternoon. That's great. Yeah, uh, so uh, so uh, what's yeah. on the wall of your Facebook? Uh, yeah, pretty much everything. Um, so uh, we, we um, I Twitter. I do Facebook. I, you know, my kids help me keep up. Um, I had to friend them, so then I was in. But, um, so how did that play out in this event? Was, was it a distraction? Uh, was there any positive consequences from having those uh, opportunities available or having those things thrown at you? Well, you know, for us, we used it to try to get information to people, to let them know. There was sort of this, it's very hard now to reach people who don't <laughs> read t TV, to let them mm -hmm. know that you're on the job and on the case and what mm -hmm. it is you're doing. And even even with all the electronic information sharing in the world, we also had to rely on plain old paper because there were a lot of people who didn't have access to the internet or if they did, they really wanted somebody to sit and explain mm -hmm. to them what we were finding. And I spent, you know, um, it pales in comparison to time uh, that spent, but hours just personally sitting with communities because sometimes that's the best way. But we've been, you know, the environmental arena is one that's based on communities and people. And so giving people, EPA doesn't protect people. People protect themselves. They need information to know what's really a threat to them and then they get upset and then they demand uh, that their government or that EPA enforce the law, whatever it is. So that's always been part of our job and we uh, have a really talented crew of folks who in communications who try to make the best of that. But it is a challenge. I mean, it takes resources and um, it takes, you know, sort of a constant uh, level of, of, um, of protection. But all of our data was online. And EPA actually played a really large role. I got to give them a shout out. Um, the folks in, I guess it was HOMA, um, were really, I think, played a role within the unified command of helping data organization across government. So we had our own data. But as everyone else is getting mm -hmm. data, they turned to EPA, who had just been doing it already, to set up a really lovely, kind of cool um, application so people could, you know, click on a map, find out what data points were around. And um, that was actually used recently to help design the next round of sampling, the, the sampling yeah. that's going on. It probably needs a, maybe another comment here. Yeah, uh, the, the whole notion of, uh, tr of transparency and, inf and, pu and public information. Uh, one of the things I thought we did really good in this response, I think we need to leverage into the future is taking a step forward on knowledge management. Uh, when these laws were written on oil spill response, 
we had not gone to the uh, uh, Microsoft open environment of the Coast Guard yet. We still have proprietary old, mm -hmm. you know, green screens. <laughs> uh, so the current response doctrine never anticipated the knowledge management requirements that we had right now. We were able to go to a public site and take most of the information regarding this response and make it available to the public online. And when you do that, uh, you obviate the need for them to guess or trying to figure out what's going on. Because you're always in the horns of a dilemma. Uh, the internet is going to be occupied and there is information out there. And if you don't put information out there, other people will and uh, it'll be on their terms. So you want to get information out there, you want to have it correct. Uh, but you also need to understand that uh, if you're not occupying that space, somebody else will. And frankly, in this day and age, information on the internet is the equivalent of non-biodegradable plastic. <laughs> it is forever. Perhaps even longer. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. Let me give each a chance to give one last word. So if you were tweeting your final takeaway for this audience, what would be uh, yeah, your, your, your last uh, 140 characters for the group, for the audience today? Um, I would simply say that GW's lucky to be able to have that joining the faculty. Um, he, has, he has lived and is obviously also a great thinker about leadership and management. And well done. And your final tweet? Well, uh, no, you can't do it back. <laughs> uh, Lisa and I had the opportunity to try and explain a very tough situation to the president a while back. <laughs> And that, by the way, support, you know, uh, the one other thing, one other thing. I just have to say this, you know, in any, in any tough position, there's also designed to be some dissonance in the federal family. We have a role that is Oh, that's natural, that's intended. Well, well <laughs> intended or not, it certainly exists. You know, and oftentimes EPA, as I referred to it in the, with the other, is the skunk at the party. Hey, hey, hold it, hold it. One, one second there before we do that. And um, I cannot tell you that oftentimes everyone else would be like, uh-oh. And he would say, well, what do you want? That's very different. When he was speaking about being willing to be open and learn and understand the dynamic of how to really work as a team, he lived it. And um, that is very, very rare in my experience, not just with EPA, but people who really do. That's how you innovate, but you have to first be willing to listen. Great. In this particular instance, we were explaining to the president how we were managing what I think we called it dynamic tension. Yes. <laughs> very landed called it. I mean, there are environmental, law, our environmental laws and regulations out there, and not all of them actually you know, align with what we're trying to achieve operationally. And on many occasions, it required Lisa and I as leaders to sit down and say, what is it we're going to do to move forward? Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's one of those t times where you revert back to your core competencies and what your organization is responsible for, and then you have to adjudicate that moving forward. And we're working issues even today uh, regarding uh, uh, the environmental implications of that response down there. And I think uh, leaders need to be prepared to sit at the table and understand there are different points of view, there are different statutory authorities that are coming into play, but how you put that all together and you actually make it work to the, the best interest of the country. Excellent. Thank you both for your leadership and for your service. And with that, Alan, EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson. <laughs>Thank you very much. I don't know about you, but I feel very privileged to have been here this afternoon to listen to all three of these leaders, and I thank them all very much. I also feel very privileged to be able to teach the students in the Trachtenberg School. We have fantastic students who are leaders, not only leaders in training, but leaders on their own right. And now I have the privilege to introduce the presidents, uh, Dominique Karras, the president of the MPA Student Association, and Bryce McNitt, the president of the public policy or the MPP Student Association that will take us to the next step in the program. Bryce and Dominique. Good afternoon. Today we have heard the accounts of two extraordinary leaders who have faced unprecedented challenges and prevailed. As students in the Trachtenberg, in the Trachtenberg School, we learned that leadership is not only confined to discussions in the classroom, but is evident in our everyday actions. As an alumnus, Admiral Allen has established precedence by setting his aims high, and as Administrator Jackson said, 
meeting and answering the call. I will close by saying one quote by Michelangelo. The greatest danger for most of us lies not in setting our aims too high and falling short, but it lies in setting our aims too low and achieving the mark. I would now like, I would now like to invite uh, Chairman of the G George Washington University Board of Trustees, Russ Ramsey, to the stage. Please join me in inviting Russ Ramsey. Uh, thank you, Dominique and Bryce. Um, on behalf of the uh, entire Board of Trustees, including several of our uh, both current and, uh, and former alumni, I, I, just want to, um, I just want to join with the Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Administration and our other distinguished guests, uh, Lisa Jackson and Ron Carley, in, in honoring really um, one of our most distinguished alum, uh, Admiral Thad Allen. And um, pri prior to just um, giving a little bit of background um, about this very important and very, um, really very special um, award. I, I'd just like to kind of go to a couple of very personal uh, stories about the Coast Guard, uh, which make this a very special afternoon for me. Um, one is not quite as hip as Twitter or uh, Facebook, but uh, I had the opportunity uh, not too long ago to be at the worldwide premiere um, of a movie called The Guardian, uh, which I believe is a spectacular showing um, it's a movie, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, starring Kevin Costner and uh, Ashton Kutcher, I think better known as uh, Demi Moore's husband. Uh, <clears throat> and I believe, uh, sir, that it's actually a, an approved movie that depicts the, um, the heroic acts of um, the Coast Guard, primarily the master swimmers and all the men and women who, you know, daily um, truly risk their lives um, to, um, to save those. Um, and today I've gotten several new takeaways, um, uh, perhaps the, the, the one I'll, that will stay with me, is dedicated to something beyond your own effort. Um, but the movie, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, has many lines, but I think the biggest line is the Coast Guard are those that are going out when everybody else is coming in. And so for that, I just want to acknowledge the, uh, the, 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 the acts of bravery, which I don't think always, and that's a, tr that's a true story, by the way, because if you think about when the Coast Guard gets called into action, it's when everybody else basically has been unable to do anything else, whether it's the Air Force or the Navy or, um, or, or other, and, uh, and it's truly these acts of bravery that, um, that make our country a, uh, a special place. Um, and also on behalf of my wife, Norma, uh, our godson is a freshman at the uh, uh, Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut, so I also thank you for your leadership. Um, it, we are very excited to have him there. Um, and so it's also an opportunity um, in keeping with, um, with our, our commitment to, to public service to, um, to, to, to really magnify you know, several things that have, that have, that have happened to, to allow this culture to create. Um, many of you may re recall that um, you know, our namesake uh, had a vision for, an for a university that would educate citizen leaders and would, would really look beyond themselves. Um, today we are a university that are educating leaders not just for the nation but also for the world, as evidence today. Our, our students, these leaders, have a passion for changing the world and have demonstrated that passion time and time again. This past academic year, they, along with faculty, staff, and even me and my fellow trustees, collectively completed 163,980 hours of service and fulfillment of First Lady Michelle Obama's challenge to the university community. And we were deeply honored to have Mrs. Obama as our commitment commencement speaker on the mall this past May. Earlier this month, nearly 2,000 members of our freshman class and staff for our second annual freshman day of service, they completed sites at all eight wards of the District of Columbia, as well as Maryland and Virginia. These are just two of the many, many examples that I could cite, but it is clear that our culture of service is central to the mission of the university, and one of which we are very, very proud. In recognition of our culture of service, the university created the Colin Powell Public Service Award, named for one of our most distinguished alumnus who has served, served and dedicated his entire career to the ideals that we celebrate here today. Last fall, I was honored to be in attendance when the inaugural award was presented to another George Washington alumna, Assistant Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Tammy Duckworth. Today, we present the award to another distinguished member of our alumni community. I would now like to invite the president of the George Washington University, St Dr. Stephen Knapp, to join me on stage for the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming 
President Knapp. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Ramsey, Administrator Jackson, Administrator Jackson, Dr. Carley, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us today to see and hear these extraordinary public servants. The Colin Powell Service Award, Public Service Award, honors a George Washington University alumnus, campus organization, or member of the university community, student, faculty, or staff, who has made an outstanding contribution to public service that brings distinction to the university and is in the spirit of the award's namesake. Today, we are truly delighted to present this award to Admiral Thad W. Allen. Admiral Allen, would you please join us on stage? <laughs> Thad W. Allen, your career has been in service to our nation. As an officer in the United States Coast Guard, beginning with your graduation from the Coast Guard Academy, you have taken on leadership assignments across the United States and around the world, both on land and at sea. You led the Coast Guard's Atlantic Area Forces in response to the attacks of September 11, 2001. A few years later, you served as the principal federal official in charge of the response and recovery operations for Hurricanes Rita and Katrina. Your final assignment with the Coast Guard was as its 23rd Commandant, a position you held from 2006 until the completion of your term this past May. During your tenure, you led the effort to modernize all aspects of the Coast Guard to ensure that it was capable of meeting the demands of the future. Perhaps the most defining moments of your service as Commandant came through your leadership of the Coast Guard's response to such a national and international incidents as hurricanes, floods, and environmental disasters. Your tenure as Commandant include, concluded while you were serving concurrently as the National Incident Commander in charge of the response to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Although you retired from the Coast Guard this past June, you still hold the National Incident Commander position to this day. In this way, you continue your service to our nation as you unquestionably put our nation's needs well above your own. In the midst of your long and distinguished career with the Coast Guard, you have also graciously extended your commitment to service to include your alma mater, the George Washington University. For more than 20 years, you have continued to serve as an advisory board member for the Trachtenberg School and its predecessor department. You have also mentored our students, served on committees, and provided sound advice on our curriculum. You will further extend your service by teaching a course this spring, thereby providing our students with a first-hand opportunity to learn from your leadership. Thad W. Allen, with sincere appreciation for your service to our nation, to your fellow citizens, and to our university, the George Washington University proudly presents you with the Colin Powell Public Service Award. Ladies and gentlemen, our Colin Powell Public Service Awardee, Admiral Thad W. Allen. The last thing you, you want to hear at this point with the reception pending is me talk more. Uh, uh, thank you both uh, for this extraordinary honor. It's been uh, my pleasure to be affiliated with this institution. Uh, I got my MPA here in, uh, in 1986. Uh, and I did get stats from uh, Kathy Newcomer, and I haven't singled out Kathy yet, but Kathy, thank you so much for the friendship over the years and the mentorship and uh, the ability to be part of this, uh, this, this terrific organization. And uh, sitting behind her is my wife, Pam, and my daughter, Megan, who is finishing her last semester of an MBA program here at GW as well. So you have a new one in the pipeline there. So <laughs> thank you all very much.